All set? Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Neil Selbin from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance in Washington, DC. Um, this is a webinar uh, sponsored by the Recycling is Infrastructure 2 campaign, a, uh, a project of three uh, national nonprofit organizations, Zero Waste USA, National Recycling Coalition, and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, we have a, a very interesting uh, present, series of presentations today uh, from uh, the various industries in the recycling field. And um, we're going to get started by my introducing uh, Jess De, uh, Del Fiaco, uh, the Institute's communications manager. Jess, if you could start us off. Oh, I think we're handing things over to Gary after oh, Okay. Excuse me, uh, Gary, did you want to uh, do your introduction? Gary, you're on mute. Sorry, um, this is part of the Recycling is Infrastructure 2 campaign, um, which <clears throat> has uh, developed the American Recycling Infrastructure Plan with the recommended, recommended $18 billion over three years and fees to cover the costs for 50 waste reduction, reuse, recycling, and composting initiatives uh, that builds on prior advocacy plans by the Recycling Partnership, um, the Food Loss and Waste Policy Action Plan, um, break free from plastic, um, pri priority plastic actions, and the Compost Act. Um, <clears throat> we're doing a series of monthly webinars. I've been doing them since May of last year. And <clears throat> coming up next month is uh, funding recycling infrastructure via disposal fees at landfills and incinerators, uh, highlighting ILSR research that has been done on um, states that have already implemented those types of fees to fund recycling uh, grants programs. On March 15th, we'll be talking about how and when to apply for federal funding, uh, not only from infrastructure, which we expect will take another uh, year probably to implement in terms of regulations and RFPs, uh, but existing funds um, that are already in the budget and available uh, with uh, RFP deadlines that are upcoming. Uh, April 5th, we'll be focusing on resource recovery parks as a uh, natural uh, way that um, transfer stations and landfills are evolving to uh, uh, facilitate the location of reuse, recycling, and composting uh, uh, infrastructure, and we'll be highlighting uh, examples uh, from around the country on that. Uh, to get uh, information on these and other campaign initiatives, join the, our Google group, the Recycling Infrastructure, at googlegroups.com. Um, we also ask that you meet with your U.S. Senator and Congressperson to highlight that recycling is infrastructure too. Uh, mention the American Recycling Infrastructure Plan and ask that um, all the infrastructure um, activities uh, include the use of reuse systems, recycled content, and compost products as part of their development. That will expand the demand for those services dramatically if everyone uh, talked with their congressmen about, uh, congresspeople about doing that. If you have questions, give me a call, email me. Look forward to working with you. And thanks, uh, ILSR, for hosting uh, this uh, webinar today. Well, thank you, uh, Gary, for the introduction to uh, the RIIT, as we call it. And I just want to mention, in case people may not know, uh, Gary is a very uh, key uh, leader in the Sierra Club, the uh, Zero Waste USA, and the National Recycling Coalition. He's been a, a terrific activist for uh, zero waste, as, as uh, many people know. So um, <clears throat> I am going to introduce all our speakers right now and then I will call on them to give their presentations in the same order. Um, I have to start off uh, by saying that Arlie uh, Owen will not be able to uh, join us today. He's preoccupied with other things uh, that came up suddenly. That's unfortunate. Um, Arlie uh, is with the Ohio Recycling Association 
he was going to give us an overview of uh, the uh, needs in the Midwest. We will check in with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, Arlie and uh, see if we could uh, forward uh, some information that he was going to present. Um, we are very lucky to have the people who are here with us uh, representing uh, different industries in the recycling sector. Um, we have Laura Henneman from Strategic uh, Materials. Uh, she is the Vice President of Marketing and Communications. Uh, uh, Strategic Materials is a national uh, company that takes uh, recycled glass and produces a whole number of industrial products from it. Uh, we also have Brian Hawkinson, the Executive Director of the American Forest and Paper Association uh, based here in Washington, DC. Um, Rachel Dial is with us from Pure Cycle. She's the Chief of Staff of the Sustainability Officer for that international company uh, focused on recovering uh, uh, plastics. Um, Frank Fra Franciosi is here with us, uh, Executive Director of the US Compost Council with many years of experience uh, to share with us. Um, we have Scott Breen, Vice President of Sustainability for the um, American can manufacturers uh, uh, to talk to us about the metal sector. Uh, and finally, we have Terry McDonald from St. Vincent de Paul uh, in Lane County, Oregon, uh, who is um, a uh, specialist in reuse and also logistics, which we'll hear about. And uh, we are thrilled to have everyone here. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Laura uh, Henneman to get us started from Strategic Materials. I, I should also mention that uh, uh, Laura is on many glass industry coalitions and uh, uh, other uh, uh, programs, not just with strategic uh, materials. Thanks, Neil. And Jess, looks like you got me queued up. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Laura Henneman. I'm representing the glass uh, sector today, I'm walking through some of our industry challenges and opportunities, especially as it relates to the infrastructure bill. Very quickly, shameless plug for who I work for, SMI. Hopefully most of you um, attending have heard of us before, Strategic Materials Inc. or SMI, which is much easier to say. We are the largest glass recycler in North America. Um, we operate in US, Canada, and Mexico, nearly 50 locations, and recycle about 3 million tons of glass per year, and would love to recycle more. Uh, our customers primarily use glass to reduce their own carbon footprint and their CO2 emissions and save energy. And believe it or not, SMI just had their 125th year anniversary last year. So we've been in business for a very long time. We started a business recycling light bulb glass for GE in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and as Neil has mentioned, I do sit on the executive board for the Glass Recycling Foundation which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And we provide grant money to try to improve glass recycling rates in the US. Uh, we're also members of the Glass Packaging Institute and the Glass Recycling Coalition, which is the sister organization to the nonprofit among other organizations that, uh, that we belong to, including the NRC. So where does glass go today? And this is an industry look. This isn't necessarily an, an SMI specific look. Um, and these are US numbers. They're, they're not accounting for all of North America. But as you can see, majority of glass that is recovered today is going back into glass manufacturing or container, um, our container industry, uh, which is uh, considered one of the highest and best use just behind refillable programs. And that's because glass can go one bottle in, one bottle out forever. Um, and you're not pulling virgin material. We'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, that's a huge market for glass today. Close second would be your fiberglass insulation. Sometimes it's called fiberglass, but it really is just going into the insulation um, industry. Um, and they can pull up to, I think, 70% recycled glass. And then you'll see some other smaller industries that are just as important, but um, as you can see, make up a, a much smaller piece of the pie when it comes to um, how glass is being recycled today in the US. So why recycle glass? Why should we care other than that's maybe what we should be doing, right? It is 100% recyclable forever. Um, like I said, one bottle in, one bottle out. It, it doesn't wear out and doesn't degrade. Um, it displaces mined virgin materials like sand as I mentioned, it melts at a lower temperature in those applications, which results in energy savings and CO2 emission reduction. 
um, and thereby also can extend the life of the furnace or the equipment that's melting these bottles down. On the fiberglass insulation side, it also allows the manufacturers to have their products be LEED eligible or Energy Star certified. From a consumer perspective and a waterway perspective, it's chemically inert. So wanted to spend most of the time talking about the challenges and opportunities and kind of a quick outlook um, forward looking. So challenges when it comes to recycling glass, which maybe some, some that are attending have their own set of challenges, but I tried to highlight some of the key ones here. The biggest challenge and it's likely the biggest challenge for all materials in the stream is contamination. Um, and what does contamination mean exactly? For us, it means anything non-glass. We do try to recycle anything non-glass that we can but usually what we're getting into our piles are trash, uh, things that can't be recovered. And we kind of think that there's two reasons for this. One is maybe it's residential education. There's confusion about what they should be putting in their cart. Maybe it's a convenience um, factor, uh, but we also think it's MRF capabilities, which is further compounded by residential issues um, as far as like wish cycling. Um, but MRFs today, some, recover glass really well and others have a lot of challenges and don't do so well. Um, as you can see on the, the photo here, this is a pretty typical san standard um, single stream glass pile. This is what we get at our facility. So as you can tell, there's not a lot of glass in there or at least it doesn't look like it. So there's a lot for us to sort out. Another challenge is collection, especially when glass is removed from a program, a traditional um, curbside single stream collection program. The collection itself can be really hard, especially in rural areas um, or in drop off programs because you're, you're changing the behavior and you're removing a convenience for residents. Logistics is a challenge again, probably for all materials. Uh, not only is glass heavy, but when you are moving piles that look like the one on the screen, uh, it's not advantageous or economically uh, viable for us to essentially move trash around and have it take the scenic route to landfill. Um, other challenges are just kind of the city budgets. I mean, that's a reality of recycling and waste disposal as a whole. Um, working through those budgets can be a challenge and, and trying to satisfy residents while balancing what you know, the city is capable of doing. And coupled with that, I kind of use the word attitudes, which might not be the best word, but um, from a Holler Murph perspective, I think there's a lot of myths around glass and glass recycling, whether it should be in the stream or not, competing materials in the, in the pile. Um, but I will say some of the attitudes are positive and some are negative. They're not all negative. Um, but by removing glass from a program, it actually increases the cost per ton for collecting all materials because you're essentially removing about 20 to 25 percent by weight from um, your collection. Um, but those, it can be a challenge to have those conversations before decisions are made or to, to work through some of the individual variables that would um, have that decision making. So secondarily, uh, we compete with landfill. Landfill is our largest competitor. Um, including alternative daily cover, which in some states is considered beneficial reuse. Uh, it makes it really difficult for us to recycle when landfill is cheaper than recycling. Um, so that's, that's one challenge that we absolutely face every single day. Deposit programs, some work very well and have been expanding, others um, still need some work. And so deposits, although work really well most of the time, there is a need for expansion, um, which can hurt the overall program. And then generally legislative support has been difficult um, for glass recycling, um, not recycling as a whole, but sometimes specific to glass. It's, it's hard to get some traction on some things that would really help get more glass into the stream and increase our recovery rates in the US. So opportunities, what can we do about it? How can we fix uh, this. And I will say that there's no silver bullet. There's no one single solution. You need many solutions in order for this to work. Even if you, if we're able to accomplish one of these, that's a step in the right direction. It's positive, we're supportive, but we also recognize the, the need to have many solutions in order to create real world change. Um, the first being a MRF cleanup system um, for glass cleanup. So it could be sequencing, um, it, adding a trommel to potentially break the glass at the beginning, have it um, come through and be able to better separate the materials through the pile. 
Um, this is a high volume impact, which is great. Um, we are very, very much advocates for this. In fact, the Glass Recycling Coalition has a MRF certification program that helps support MRFs in giving them solutions. Residential education, CART audits and tagging programs are critical to help on that front end. Um, investments in non-traditional collections. So I mentioned drop-off programs. They tend to be very expensive, so they do require investment. Um, legislative efforts, I won't go through all of them, but there are a lot of options in, in regards to regulating ADC um, and increasing landfill, tipping fees, um, mandatory recycling or recycling targets by state, and then commercial collection. Uh, bar and restaurants, multifamily. Um, and I did throw on minimum recycle content, uh, which is important, but kind of needs some of the other things to work with that in order to make that successful. And then bottle bill expansion. So including wines or increasing the deposit. Next slide, please. So quick outlook. This should be my last slide. I know it, it moves quickly, but uh, we want to make sure we've got enough time for everybody to present and uh, have plenty of time for Q&A. But I think from a glass perspective, the brands and the manufacturers who are making bottles for these brands or making fiberglass insulation for these brands have very aggressive sustainability goals. That's not going away. In fact, it's only gonna increase. Um, the Glass Packaging Institute has a 10 year roadmap to get to about 50% recycled content in their bottles. Um, manufacturers are gonna continue to feel the pressure both um, from their company perspective, but also from a government perspective to reduce their CO2 emissions. And brands want to increase their recycled content. So demand is much higher even today than what we can recover. Um, according to the EPA, we only recover about a third of all the glass that is generated in the United States. So we've got a lot of opportunity to uh, improve that. Um, but glass will continue to be one of those stable commodities in the stream as a result of those things. So it's just a matter of how do we invest in the right areas to get more glass in the stream or out of the stream and then being able to meet that demand. Next slide. Thank you. There's my email address. I know we'll do Q&A, but um, if you want to contact me, that is my email. Yeah, we, we do have some questions in Q&A. We'll certainly come back to you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, I, oh, I just wanted to say, uh, Laura used the, the, the initials ADC, Alternative Daily Cover, uh, ADC. Um, Okay, so we're going to ask Brian uh, Harkinson from the American uh, Forest and Paper Association to uh, fill us in on the paper industry. Great, thanks, Neil. Uh, and thanks very much for inviting me to participate in the webinar with you all. Uh, as Neil mentioned, uh, I'm Brian Hawkinson. I'm the Executive Director of Recovered Fiber with the American Forest and Paper Association. Uh, AFMPA is the National Trade Association that advances a sustainable pulp paper packaging and wood products manufacturing industry. We engage in fact-based public policy and marketplace advocacy and represent about 84% of the total US pulp paper, paper-based packaging and tissue manufacturing capacity. Uh, this afternoon, I'll start by spending a few minutes describing the industry's investment in mill manufacturing infrastructure using recovered paper. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the trends that are driving that increased investment. I'll discuss some challenges facing the industry and identify some investment needs uh, that address those challenges. In terms of investments in mill manufacturing capacity using recovered paper, um, pulp paper and paperboard companies have either completed or announced approximately 5 billion in mill manufacturing infrastructure between 2019 and the end of 2023 to continue the best use of recovered paper in manufacturing. And those investments include things like building new paper mills, uh, building new paper machines in existing mills, and converting existing paper machines uh, to make a new product or products. An example of that would be a paper machine in a mill that had been used to make newsprint uh, can be converted to the uh, to start making recycled uh, container board or wire board. That five billion in uh, mill manufacturing uh, investments does not include investments in, uh, for example, converting facilities where the paper or paperboard is uh, used uh, and uh, converted into the boxes or finished product. 
And it also doesn't include investments in uh, materials recovery facilities. Uh, paper and paperboard manufacturing companies own and operate more than 100 MRFs uh, nationwide. Now that additional manufacturing capacity that I mentioned uh, will use approximately 8 million tons of recovered paper, uh, predominantly uh, old corrugated containers or OCC and mixed paper uh, in manufacturing annually. So to put 8 million tons uh, in context, uh, U.S. mills consumed about 32 million tons of recovered paper in 2020. So that additional 8 million tons uh, would represent about a 25% increase from the 2020 uh, consumption level. Okay, what are some of the trends driving that investment? Over the last 10 years or so, production in paper and paperboard in the U.S., uh, has been trending and is continuing to trend toward paperboard. Over the period between 2011 and 2020, the production of newsprint in the U.S. dropped by about 85%, or 8.9 million tons. Printing and writing papers also dropped, uh, not nearly as much, but also dropped uh, by about 54%, so down about 5 million tons. Boxboard, uh, down just a little bit, about 1%, or about 100,000 tons. And container board, the material that goes into making corrugated boxes, uh, increased by about 11% over that period. So you can see the shift going away from paper toward paper-based packaging. And the marketplace is shifting. Far greater demand for packaging, uh, as I described. Uh, the mill investments are designed to meet the changing marketplace needs. And individual member companies are making investment decisions that are consistent with their business models and with their future plans. So I uh, said I would mention a couple of challenges facing paper recycling. I'll talk uh, about three principally. Uh, the first one is uh, contamination in collection streams for recovered paper, principally from residential collection. Laura also mentioned this in her comments. Uh, about 40 to 45% of the recovered paper that is used in U.S. mills is sourced from residential collection streams. So the more contaminated they are, the more it costs the mills money to clean the fiber before it can be used, uh, and the fewer and the more problems uh, that it creates on the paper machines and in the finished product. So contamination uh, is a big, uh, big problem. Another issue, uh, and this is more prevalent in some parts of the country than others, uh, but uh, more mixed waste processing systems. Uh, these are single stream collection systems that commingle uh, recyclable materials with residential trash, with the idea that the recyclable materials get pulled out of the trash uh, in the processing uh, facility. Um, these are more prevalent in California, I think, than in other places in the country, but there are some around the country. Uh, the issue is that commingling trash uh, with recovered paper contaminates the paper and makes it largely unusable uh, in many of our member companies' mills. And then one additional uh, uh, issue is that the lack of recognition among policymakers, different recyclable materials have different sustainability profiles, different recycling records, and a one-size-fits-all uh, approach taken in legislation doesn't work. Uh, the same for all materials. I'll hit on a couple of investment uh, needs uh, to address those challenges. Uh, one uh, that came in the Recycle Act that was passed last year, meeting some of that, uh, that provides for consumer education grants through EPA via toolkit for municipal and commercial recycling programs. That's a great way uh, to inform consumers about the economic benefits of recycling. How to recycle right it helps to dispel myths about what happens to recyclables in the collection streams. It will boost, hopefully, boost uh, consumer participation, give them more confidence in what they're doing really matters, help them understand how to do it right, and reduce contamination in the supply stream. Also, a few things that uh, I noticed in the American Recycling uh, Infrastructure Plan, uh, some investments that, that are proposed there that can be beneficial. Uh, including uh, full uh, implementation of cart-based collection in areas that doesn't, uh, don't have that already. AFMPA was an inaugural funder of the recycling partnerships we've been engaged in 
public private partnerships to affect this for a number of years. This is probably the best single step to take to expand collection uh, for consumers. Another one is funding improvements in MRFs to improve capture and reduce contamination. A great way to help uh, improve the quality of recyclable materials. Uh, funds need to be made available to both public and private MRFs for that to not be a vehicle for picking winners and losers in the marketplace. Uh, and then finally, funding uh, recycling collection systems. Uh, again, another way to help increase uh, recycle, uh, uh, access to consumers and increase collection of uh, recyclable materials. Neil, I think that's about my seven minutes. You're on mute. Yep, thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, well done, we, we've got questions for you and we'll certainly come back. Um, I'm, we're gonna go to Rachel Dial now from Pure Cycle. Uh, 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 <clears throat> technologies uh, and uh, take it away, Rachel. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, bear with me while I get my presentation up fast. All right. So very nice to meet you all. My name is Rachel Dial and I am the Chief of Staff and uh, Director of Sustainability at PureCycle Technologies. And we are a emerging technology in the plastics recycling space. Um, we are oftentimes confused as a chemical recycling company. However, we are a physical separation purification technology that is able to restore polypropylene plastic waste back to a clear virgin-like state. Um, and I think that's really important because one of the issues with plastics recycling today is kind of the limitations on what can happen to the material um, once it's been recycled. Uh, polypropylene, I'm not sure if you've heard of it before, but it is one of the most used plastics and it, the uses continue to increase every day. Polypropylene was uh, developed in the 1950s. It's an extremely versatile Palmer and is ever increasing in market and continues to uh, be expected to increase. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the recycling infrastructure in the United States. Back in the late eighties, early nineties, when we started um, to divert critical mass from the landfills and started to put plastics recycling in place, the initial target was the water bottle. So in the early nineties, you had your segregated um, your segregated recycling streams where you had your glass, your paper, your plastic. And the, the first target was that, that water bottle made of PET, which we're much better at recycling than polypropylene today. Um, since then, you've seen an increase of plastic packaging, moving away from the glass jars, moving away from the cardboard packaging, and more and more products are moving to that plastic. Um, plastic is lightweight, it's, it's more sustainable to ship, um, you know, you have less issues sometimes with, you know, breaking, so it, it is, and one, when it was developed, it was intended to be a sustainable product, but as everyone knows, uh, the plastic crisis has uh, really uh, taken, taken into a, you know, monster, and, um, you know, plastic is the face of evil today, so we're really excited about our technology. I think one of the keys for you know, getting control of this plastic crisis is being able to bring back value to the material. So changing the way the consumer is looking at the packaging from it's trash to it's a renewable resource. So you can see her on my screen. Um, there are polypropylene technologies that exist today, however, um, at the broader scale, the end use applications are extremely limited in what you can do. So if you think of everything that's on your dairy aisle, a tub is a very common uh, polypropylene packaging. So everything on your dairy aisle, whether that's your butter tub, your sour cream tub, a um, bunch of different colors, if you melt them down and mix them together, you're gonna get a black or gray resin. And a lot of times, um, you know, it's not sufficient to go back into a food grade application. So that's where our technology comes in. Um, we use a series of extraction and filtration. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. 
but are essentially able to dry clean the molecule. It's much like a dry cleaner. That's a great analogy that we use all the time. And um, we're able to liquefy the polypropylene and then remove all the contamination, whether that's color, odor, and additive that is um, you know, added to the virgin resin for some sort of prefer performance characteristic. We actually pull all of that out and then yield a clear virgin-like resin that can be colored and molded into high value new, new products. Um, so we are a new company. We were founded in 2015 and we really secured our first round of funding for um, our first commercial plant, which will be located in Southern Ohio uh, in October of 2020. Uh, we have aligned ourselves with uh, the industry leaders, the NRC, of course, um, you know, we're very active in the polypropylene recycling coalition. One of the things that um, is a hindrance to polypropylene collection or recycling today is that it's not collected, um, you know, across the United States. And so the polypropylene Re recycling coalition is, um, has the mission to increase collection uh, across the United States and bring more outlets to consumers so that we can change the mindset of the consumer and the polypropylene packaging can become that water bottle that everybody knows can serve another life. So up here I have a summary of what our process is. Um, we start off with feedstock processing. So one of the things like the um, lack of collection across the United States is also the lack of separation. Luckily, we are starting to see more and more MRFs, material recovery facilities across the nation, pulling out that number five, thanks to the work of the Recycling Partnership and the Polypropylene Co uh, Coalition, um, so that we're able to get that segregated polypropylene to be able to process it and give it yet another life. Um, I did want to reiterate that we are not a chemical uh, chemical recycling technology. I know there's been a lot of debate around uh, what about these solutions where you're turning plastics into fuel. That is not our category. We are simply a physical separation process that does use a solvent. So we're not changing the monomer. It stays plastic. Um, so we're going plastic to plastic instead of plastic to fuel. And um, you know, with that, we have a much lower LCA than what you would get if you're going to plastic to fuel back to plastic. Um, as far as where we are, we do have a very uh, aggressive uh, expansion plan. As I mentioned, our first plant is going to be in Southern Ohio. That plant will come online at the end of the year this year and will recycle more than 120 million pounds of polypropylene waste. Uh, last year, we did sign our second location. Uh, we'll be building a secondary plant in Augusta, Georgia. And then also we are under construction for our first um, prep facility. And so this kind of ties into the hub and spoke model that you're starting to see to tap into more and more areas to give them access to recycling, um, as well as uh, being able to aggregate the polypropylene you know, and be able to ship it economically. So with the prep strategy, it's, it's exactly the hub and spoke. Um, so we are hoping to put upwards of eight facilities. So, you know, as the polypropylene collection is expanding across the nation, it is still, um, you know, recycled at rates of anywhere from four to 6% globally. And in the United States, polypropylene packaging is around 1%. So, as these efforts are in place to increase those numbers, we want to put our hub locations to be able to aggregate that polypropylene resin, sort it out, whether it's if it's coming in a commingled bale, like a three through seven or a one through seven, and then ship just the polypropylene to our purification site where we can give it that second, third, fourth life. Um, with that, as I mentioned before, uh, critical mass is one of the challenges that we're working to overcome. So we have put in place a uh, feedstock strategy to be able to target um, from a couple different uh, buckets of feedstock. Obviously, and I think is most relevant to this call is your national curbside collection programs. 
we integrated or we reverse integrated and had the prep strategy to be able to tap into areas that aren't um, equipped to sort out polypropylene. So an area might be um, collecting number five. However, there's not enough critical mass for them to make a number five bale. Therefore, it just flows into the one through seven or three through seven that in a lot of places is landfill today. So we're targeting those commingled bales to pull it out and make sure that we can give it another life. We're aligning ourselves with industry partners that take the other types of plastics, the, the polyethylenes, um, the LDPs, all of that, um, so that we can keep it out of the landfill. And with that, I think I'm done. Well, thank you, uh, Rachel. That, that um, yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted. Thank you, Rachel. That was, uh, uh, that was terrific. We, as I said to the others, we definitely have questions for you and we'll, we'll get back. Um, for now, I would like to uh, introduce Frank Franciosi from the uh, US uh, Compost Council uh, to talk about the challenge of organics. Frank. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for having me uh, today uh, to discuss um, what's going on in the organics world. Um, uh, composting infrastructure in the United States uh, is something that uh, is sorely needed. Uh, only about 5% of, uh, of organics uh, nationally is composted. So therefore there's a, a tremendous opportunity to increase infrastructure. Um, the Composting Council uh, is a 501c6 trade organization. Uh, we also have a, a sister organization um, called the uh, Research and Education Foundation. Um, and that foundation is, is mainly uh, involved in uh, working on the educational part of the composting industry and also uh, looking at the uh, research on compost use. So um, I'd like to talk about two things. What's driving compost here in the U.S. and what are the hurdles um, and some of those issues that uh, come up uh, and talk a little bit more about uh, funding and infrastructure. Uh, so some of the big drivers are both in international and national levels with uh, the goals that EPA and USDA has set um, for uh, reducing uh, organics going into the landfill by 2030 at 50%. Um, we're seeing a lot of states, particularly in the Northeast, with organic landfill bans um, that have been successful. Um, we see that expanding. Um, obviously, California um, has that in place now. And then we'll also see some of the larger cities and municipalities. Um, I believe San Francisco is, is now uh, in its 25th year of, of recycling its organics uh, with, into composting. Um, some of the other demands some of the other speakers talked about the consumer is demanding uh, less plastic and more circular products. So we're seeing more demand on compostable products um, instead of uh, going into recycling, but going into compost, anything that's food related or food package or food service related. Um, and then uh, some of the companies now are also looking at uh, being more sustainable, um, particularly in the restaurant industry. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, of changes in menus and also uh, changes in the way they serve, uh, as well as universities um, and the way they serve their, their food. Uh, and then, uh, believe it or not, there's a, a, an extreme demand for good quality compost product. Um, so one of the bigger drivers, uh, so those of you that have delved into the numbers, uh, Refed uh, published um, a while ago um, looking at centralized composting. And, and when I talk about food waste here, I don't really talk about food waste I like to consider it food scrap. Food scrap is, to me, is something that you cannot uh, rescue. You can't feed it to, uh, to humans and you can't feed it to animals. Um, it normally goes into the landfill. Uh, and obviously, uh, when it gets into the landfill, it's creating methane. A uh, refed study is, uh, says that about 13.8 uh, million tons of food scrap can be diverted annually from landfills. Uh, which would uh, estimate uh, about 4.9 million tons of greenhouse gas that would be eliminated, also creating 14,000 jobs. So if you think of the impact of composting and taking that food scrap and composting it, uh, a lot of people think about the diversion part, but you really also have to think about 
the end use and what compost is doing at the end use because there's a there's a uh, an extra benefit to uh, carbon sequestration in the soil and also reduction in uh, using uh, chemical fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, um, making uh, the the soils a lot more healthy and uh, and adding uh, and adding microbes to the soil as well. So making that soil and making crops more productive. So um, there is definitely a uh, a quantitative effect of uh, not only uh, diverting it but also using compost. Um, so what are some of the hurdles for infrastructure growth? Um, I think some of the other speakers talked about the lack of public education. And when I speak to this, I speak really around uh, outreach uh, on, at source separation. I think uh, we as a group that are on this call really should look at a national program where we can educate people and do a better job at the can, where they have to make that decision on what goes into recycling what goes into uh, the landfill and what goes into compost. Um, so I urge everybody that uh, we, when we look at uh, ways to get funding, we, we also look at um, the public education and outreach uh, side. <clears throat> state level, um, a lot of the states- uh, Frank, Frank, could yes, you yes. Uh, make sure your slides are advancing? We're not seeing any slides going. What are you seeing now? Are you seeing hurdles for infrastructure? I don't know. We're seeing the first slide, your cover slide. Okay. All right. I'm advancing. Let me try to go back. All right. Can you see this slide? We're seeing national drivers now. Okay, good. I'm just going to use this mode because apparently the other mode um, is not working. Um, so I talked about this already about refed and, and where it's going. Uh, I'm on hurdles uh, to infrastructure growth. I talked about public education and outreach, um, state permitting. Uh, when you look at the states here, the 50 states, uh, permitting is all over the board. It takes you five years to get a permit in California. It may take you uh, less than a year to get a permit in North Carolina. So uh, trying to get more uh, templated uh, state permitting legislation and uh, rules passed. So um, there's more of a level playing field and there's an easier way to get facilities permitted. Uh, a lot of this also has to do with zoning uh, and siting of facilities, just like any other uh, waste um, uh, resource center. Um, the, the municipality has control over the zoning and the siting. So we'd like to see uh, municipalities start carving out areas uh, for recycling zones and composting, uh, particularly in the organics area, the organics collection, the separation, uh, and then the composting. Contamination, uh, a big issue in every one of our industries that we're talking about here today. Again, some of that I think has to be done at the front end, uh, but we definitely need more investment in, in, uh, in technology on sorting on the front end and also on the back end. And then finally, financing, uh, you know, getting more government help uh, to jumpstart the infrastructure growth here uh, in the U.S. Um, so, you know, where does it all start? It all starts with the, with the solid waste plan and municipal level. And municipalities have to really uh, carve out that spot for organics uh, in their solid waste plans uh, and look more long term and not short term and just about, well, we need to build it on the landfill and now it's going to be 60 miles further out from, from, our, uh, from our locale. Um, I'd like to see more uh, planning uh, as, as a part of using organics uh, as a local resource. Um, it can create jobs. It creates a product. Uh, the product can be used locally. Um, so it makes a heck of a lot of sense when you look at this uh, from a, a life cycle analysis standpoint. Um, as we all know that the organics is the heaviest part of the waste stream, 35% uh, of it could be compostable. Um, so this could be a big chunk and a big uh, change really uh, in the way we do things. Uh, and, you know, I think when municipalities look at this, they, they're, they're kind of lost. Uh, so the councils put together a target organics program. If you go to our website and you just do a search for target organics, um, you will find uh, some toolkits that are in there that we've created over the past year and a half uh, to help this municipalities, whether they're in the beginning stage of looking at drop-off centers, 
to the point where they're looking at um, you know, converting over their existing yard waste facility to uh, handle food scrap. Uh, so funding, again, is a big deal. Um, as you all know, uh, this is the first time ever that our industry has really uh, gone out and joined forces uh, and created a group um, called the United States Composting Infrastructure Coalition. This is made up of a lot of, uh, of grassroots organizations, um, some that are on this call today, uh, plant-based products. <coughs> Council um, is one of the drivers in here. And we really have put forth an act to get asked Congress for $2 billion over the course of 10 years. Um, so what, what does that all mean? What do we, what do we use that 10 billion for? Um, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, infrastructure, uh, capital, uh, CapEx facilities, um, you know, uh, brick and mortar uh, equipment, uh, converting over yard waste facilities to handle food scrap, expansion of existing facilities, really at all levels. Uh, when I say all levels, from the community composting level all the way up to uh, large centralized facilities. Um, the, the real number that we really need, if you look at the back of the envelope calculation, um, is more, more like $3 billion. Um, and you know, what does that all equate to in, in number of facilities? If you go back to that slide, that 13.8 million tons a year of food scrap that's generated every year, if we were to take that and compost all of that, um, you're looking at medium-sized facilities uh, that would handle somewhere around 50,000 tons a year. And keep in mind that it's just not food scrap that you're composting, but you need carbon to go with that. So you're going to need to take yard waste or some type of carbon source to, to blend with that. Um, we would need somewhere in a neighborhood of 600 to 700 facilities uh, in the U.S. to be able to capture that 13.8 billion tons a year. That's all I have. Frank, thank you so much. Um, a lot, lot to chew on, literally. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, we're going to go right now to Scott Green from the American Can Man Manufacturers Association. Scott, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Neil. Nice to be with everybody and hear about all the what's going on with all the material types. I'm here to talk about metal cans. Uh, so I'm Scott Green, Vice President of Sustainability at the Can Manufacturers Institute. Uh, we're a trade association, represent U.S. metal can manufacturing and their suppliers, formed way back in 1939. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see we've got the black and white photos to prove it. Uh, but one of the things that we do is we collect shipment data from our members. And so you see here the billions of cans we produce each year. Uh, I don't have the aluminum beverage can number for this past year, but I can tell you it grew. There's a lot of demand for aluminum beverage cans out there uh, because of our industry-leading recycling rate, industry-leading recycled content, which you'll see on the next slide. So this is our aluminum beverage can sustainability key performance indicators. We put this out each year with the Aluminum Association, uh, comparing us to glass bottles and PET bottles on recycling rate, on a new indicator we put out, the closed loop circularity rate, which is of the containers being recycled, what percent turn into another beverage container? So you can see with aluminum cans, it's super high. Uh, and then recycled content, and then value of material, which is a two-year rolling average. Uh, just getting back to the industry-leading recycling rate, so you see here 90,000 aluminum beverage cans recycled each minute. This stat always kind of blows me away. That's 47 billion recycled in 2020. That's like 11, 12 packs per person recycled in the United States. Uh, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing. Um, but beyond just the numbers of how many are being recycled, there's also an economic driver that comes from recycling these cans. So we put out a report uh, just a little over a year ago where it, the, it was concluded that without the important revenue stream from UBCs or used beverage cans, most material recovery facilities in the United States would not be able to operate with their current business model. So material recovery facility, MRF or sorting single stream recyclables, this makes sense considering the recycling partnership they put out uh, in their 2020 state of curbside report they found that aluminum and steel cans were about 6% by weight of all recyclables generated at single family homes, but represented a little over half of the revenue. So cans really pack a punch in terms of their economic impact, given how much they weigh. So what you're seeing on the slide now is the value of these cans. And I 
just talked on the last slide about overall the impact of recycling these cans. Here you're seeing the per ton, the per pound, and that the report was actually written like more in the in the first number there, December 2020. You see the numbers have grown; they've grown for most commodities, uh, but that just shows you how the economic impact of recycling has grown even more for cans. Um, but at the same time, even though we have this high economic impact, when it comes to aluminum beverage cans, we're missorting too many of these cans at the material recovery facility. So on the next slide, you'll see that another report we put out found that up to one in four aluminum beverage cans is missorted at the MRF. So that's up to one in four, that's kind of worst case scenario, but even one in eight, one in 10, that's still a lot of valuable aluminum beverage cans that we wanna turn into new cans that are being missorted, right? So on the next slide, you'll see that the way that uh, all the aluminum cans are sorted at these MRFs is with an eddy current separator. It's super effective uh, once the material reaches the eddy current. The issue is more what's happening before it reaches the eddy current. You could think of cans crushed vertically into pucks. They go into the glass vine, fine or residue stream. Uh, I know Laura and I have talked about that. They get some of our cans. Some cans are crushed horizontally into flat objects sorted into paper. Uh, so we want to make sure that the cans come directly to us so that we can ensure that they're going to get recycled the vast majority of the time into a new can. Uh, so what are we doing about it? Well. As an industry, we did a can capture grant program this past year. We did it with the Recycling Partnership. It was funded by Ardell Metal Packaging, Crown Holdings, two of the largest aluminum beverage can manufacturers in the United States. And you see here the five MRFs, material recovery facilities across the country, we gave grants to. Most of them were for new eddy currents, some were for some other equipment to capture those misdirected cans. And collectively, just by giving some grants to these five MRFs, we're gonna capture 71 million aluminum beverage cans per year with that equipment. That's $1.15 million in revenue when those cans are sold. And the energy savings that comes from recycling those cans, instead of them being assorted and likely going to landfill, we can power more than 28 million US homes for an hour. So big economic impact, big environmental impact from capturing these cans. Now, what are we doing to build off this? Well, in the we're doing a lease to own program where we we're happy with the success that we had with the grant program. But at the same time, because of the economic value of the can that I was talking about earlier, it doesn't need to be a grant. Uh, what's nice about the can is that it pays its own way. And we feel like we could instead do a program where we pay for the upfront cost of the equipment. Murph doesn't have to pay anything. Equipment gets installed. They're capturing cans they otherwise wouldn't have captured, selling cans they otherwise wouldn't be selling. And then they can pay us back over time with some portion of the revenue from these newly captured cans. Uh, the Murph wins because they don't have to use any upfront capital to pay for the equipment. We win because we're getting new cans captured. And we also win because instead of a grant, it's now money coming back to us that we can then loan out again. So we're pretty stoked about this program and excited to get that off the ground for this year. And uh, in terms of more looking, zooming out a bit more beyond what we're doing in the MRF, we put out an aluminum beverage can recycling rate targets. 70% uh, by 2030 is what we're starting with. On the next slide, you see the four pillars of action that we have to make progress toward those recycling rate targets. You've got well-designed deposit systems. You've got increasing household and away from home recycling, proper sortation at recycling centers, and increased consumer awareness of the can sustainable advantages. These actually align quite well um, with uh, the Recycling is Infrastructure 2 campaign plan. They're calling for adopting and establishing national beverage container deposit legislation. Okay, that's pillar number one. Um, and I, I know Laura mentioned them too. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Um, we're putting a lot of thought leadership out there around well-designed beverage container deposit systems. And I could talk more about that in the Q&A if people are interested. Uh, another one is funding the implementation of cart-based collection. We think that's really important to increasing household recycling. Investing in new and existing MRFs. Uh, we think more of that should go towards can capture equipment because that'll give those MRFs more revenue to invest more generally. And then lastly, funding education and engagement for material quality and optimized recovery. That aligns well with pillar number four. Uh, and we think that those communications efforts should focus on the high value materials because you get more of those back, you've got more money for the whole recycling system. So uh, those are our pillars of action. They align quite well with the Recycling Infrastructure 2 plan. Uh, and then lastly, just to sum up here, give an overview of the next slide. Uh, the most needed can capture equipment in terms of infrastructure is these eddy currents. We need more of them. Even if you have one, putting a second one where there's misrotation, you can capture a lot of cans, it can pay for itself. We're trying to stimulate it, but government money that comes in for recycling infrastructure should prioritize the can capture equipment 
because it's capturing material that will provide a lot of revenue uh, for the whole facility. Steel cans effectively separated out with magnets, pretty straightforward there. Uh, and the nice thing is once we have that sortation for structure, there's ready end markets to buy as many of these cans as we can get our hands on. So happy to do the Q&A and thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, appreciate it. And we are going to go right to Terry McDonald from Eugene, Oregon. Uh, thank you, Neil. So I represent the uh, retail thrift industry and the uh, retail thrift industry is an old industry going back to the 19th century in the United States, the old rag and bone guy that used to gather this stuff uh, in a cart down the major urban centers of the United States. It's a mature industry, but it's also rapidly changing in that it's growing very rapidly. So the bricks and mortar retail thrift store uh, used to be a relatively small uh, a business uh, used to have a small footprint. A typical thrift, a thrift store back in the 1950s was about 5,000 square foot. That was a large one. Uh, the typical thrift store today is around 20 to 25,000 square foot, and they continue to proliferate like little rabbits around the country. Uh, so it's a multi billion dollar business, and it's based upon, of course, the consumer continuing to uh, uh, buy and buy more consumer products, uh, most of it now coming through the Amazon universe. Uh, but uh, it's a, it, it continues to be based upon retail, thrift, uh, textile, uh, shoes, belts, purses, and so forth. That's uh, the traditional, uh, traditional market has thrown off for, for, for years. Uh, there are a few new wrinkles in the industry, uh, and those wrinkles are uh, associated with products that are now coming through product stewardship programs. So the electronics uh, programs that are out around the United States uh, has increased the amount of electronics flowing into the thrift industry, also has made it more attractive to do that business for both resale and for uh, recycling. Uh, and uh, other product stewardship bills associated with other products in the waste stream, especially mattress recycling, uh, is changing the face of retail thrift to some degree around the United States. CFC recovery programs uh, for the refrigerators, that's chlorofluorocarbons and greenhouse gases that are in refrigerators, has uh, also stoked the rebuilding business associated with the retail thrift operations. Um, so it becomes very cost effective for a nonprofit organization uh, to go into the CFC recovery business or the greenhouse gas recovery business associated with refrigeration if a portion of that stream can be also upcycled or recycled back into reused uh, uh, appliances, rebuilt appliances going back into the marketplace. Uh, and that continues to be a, a robust and growing industry. Uh, this is an industry also that has uh, changed its demographics in terms of where the product can be sold. Now I said it was a retail thrift business and it is, it's bricks and mortar. Uh, but increasingly, the demand for the product is not in major urban areas. Uh, major urban areas throw off enormous amounts of uh, uh, shoes, belts, purses, the reusables that you traditionally think of. Um, uh, and so the marketplace uh, actually is oversupplied in major urban areas. Uh, whereas in secondary and tertiary markets, those are the small communities or else ones that are more rural, actually the demand for that product is very high. Of course, the problem is how do you get the product from the place where it's produced in the major urban area uh, to the more rural area cost effectively? Uh, and that's where logistics really becomes very important. Uh, and logistics are one of the great issues associated with every, pre every presenter that we have uh, in the panel today, uh, meaning that we deal with low value, high volume products, whether it's clothing coming out of a retail thrift operation is going to go to the international rag market, or whether it's uh, textiles that are not going to be used for clothing again, and they're going back into the, uh, the garnetting and shredding industry that puts it in to re, uh, uh, rebuilt uh, mattress pads or underlayment for carpets. Uh, all those products are high volume and low value. Uh, and the transportation of that product really becomes an issue especially the way that the transportation system in the United States has evolved, actually in the world has evolved over the last 50 years. Uh, so it used to be that you used to build trains by boxcar by boxcar and gondola by gondola uh, and, uh, and move the product around based upon the load uh, that went from one port to the next to the next. Uh, 
Uh, and, and that building of trains that way meant that you were quite flexible. So I'm sure all of us remember when there used to be a railroad spur at every industrial site around a, a city or a county, uh, and those boxcars could be picked up, put onto a train to ship them to wherever they were going. Well, that system is long gone. Uh, now we're building uh, intermodal trains, trains that are bringing containers that uh, can be taken off that train, put onto the back of a container that is then hauled to a facility uh, by truck. Uh, the problem with the intermodal facilities is that there is not that many of them around there. And the infrastructure bill, I'm hoping, is going to address some of that. So if you can imagine being in rural Oregon, which is where I'm at, uh, the closest intermodal port is a long ways away. Uh, by that, I mean 110 miles, it's the closest one, but the major intermodal port is about 300 miles away. The freight companies want to send their product to that intermodal port 300 miles away because it's most cost effective for them. So without an intermodal port close to me, I have to pay an enormous amount of money for the transit going from that intermodal port 300 miles away to my dock which decreases the ability for me to move product in and out and of course take advantage of backhaul lanes and so forth. What I hope will happen is over time we'll develop more intermodal ports in smaller uh, metropolises and communities. Uh, so if you had an intermodal port within 20 miles of you wherever you were in the United States, the ability to move product to, uh, around the country, uh, that high volume, low value product, goes up enormously. By doing that, you'd be able to then take advantage of spot markets around the United States. So for example, I recycle a lot of uh, mattresses and the, one of the products that comes out of mattresses is cotton. Uh, that cotton has to go someplace and currently there's really only one place in the United States that I can send that product to, it's in Prescott, Arizona. Well, the problem with that is, is that all of the producers of that same product that are doing mattress recycling on the East Coast can't get to that market because it's so far away and they can't get a of volume put together to put it on a train to ship it that far. However, if the intermodal ports were available everywhere, you would be able to gain enough volume out of that to go ahead and get it to those facilities around the United States. Same thing for all the other commodities we've been talking about. So one of the things I'm hoping that will come out of this discussion as we go forward is that intermodal ports are going to be more prolific around the country uh, that will allow us to move product a lot more cost effectively over time. Uh, the future for our industry continues to be very robust. Uh, we're anticipating that as product stewardship bills come forward for other commodities like carpets and so forth, uh, that we'll have more opportunities in the thrift industry uh, to garner more product that we can get out of that stream and that we'll be able to recycle a portion of probably 90% of it, but a portion of it can actually be recycled back into reused carpets or reused products. Likewise, upcycling, we see a great future for them. That's the recasting of a product into something else. And again, if we could move that product around the country cost effectively by using intermodal ports, intermodal transportation, it will decrease our cost of doing business, increase the opportunity for recycling and upcycling and creating new products. Thank you. Well, thank, <clears throat> thank you, um, uh, Terry. And we're gonna get to questions for everyone. I wanna start with you, Terry. Could you just give us a sense of how much space and how much capital an intermodal facility would cost? I is there a ballpark figure? Well, it's a, uh, that's a tricky question because there are two parts to it. Uh, one is, is that intermodal ports uh, generally require uh, about 25 acres and a lot of about $100, $100 million worth of investment. However, elsewhere in the world, intermodal ports have, don't have that cost at all. Basically, you have just a siding where you can just bring up a front loader, pull the machine, pull the equipment off and drop it. It's just that the freight companies don't make as much money doing it that way and they don't want it to happen. So the infrastructure necessary, if we change the business model, would actually be very cost effective. Now, a small intermodal port uh, can be generally uh, done for about $10 million. Thank you for the political economy of intermodal transportation. <laughs> Appreciate it, Terry. Um, now, um, Gary and I are going to go through the questions. Uh, Gary, please join me and just chime in. Um, I'm going to start with a question that several people uh, asked. Uh, 
per, per, it, it, this is open for, for everyone, but perhaps the glass and paper and organics people might uh, choose to, uh, to chime in. And that is, uh, do, does the industry prefer dual stream collection as opposed to single stream? And um, if so, uh, do you do people in, in each of these industries, do you see a trend toward uh, dual stream at the municipal level? Um, I'm going like to start. Please, please, Brian. Thank Great. you. <laughs> yeah, uh, and remind room with the American Forest and Paper Association. Our Thank members you. Members recycle paper. Uh, dual stream has a lot less contamination than single stream, right? So the dual stream system fibers in one containers are in the other. Um, the contamination is a lot lower. I think the mills would rather get uh, material out of the dual stream system. The problem is that the trend is going the opposite way. Um, we do research every few years looking at community recycling programs. I think the last time we did it was 2014, and that number was around 86%, I think, uh, of the community recycling programs are single stream. We're updating that research. That's going to be uh, uh, based on 2021 data will be released shortly, and it's going even more skewed towards single stream. So. Uh, unfortunately, I think that ship has left the port and we're not going to see wide scale uh, movement back to dual stream. Uh, thank, thank you for that, Brian, and your report will be very interesting. Um, we are seeing interest in, in dual stream, mainly uh, on the East Coast, where we see uh, prices uh, for processing much lower for dual stream uh, than single stream. Uh, and also, you're quite correct, the recently uh, recent reports from the uh, uh, partnership, recycle partnership, um, their studies are terrific studies on single stream recycling, but they've abandoned dual stream recycling and we hope uh, future research will uh, better inform us on that. Um, Laura, may I uh, uh, ask you to address the dual and single stream uh, issue? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, like everything else when it comes to recycling, it's a complex issue. Mm -hmm. um, single stream, I think to Brian's point is sort of the mainstay. Um, I think it's what's preferred from a convenience standpoint, from, you know, being a resident, you want to throw everything in one bin. I think from a collector MRF perspective or a hauler, depending on that relationship, they'd prefer one pickup rather than uh, other, you know, potentially more pickups, but also then they can throw everything in one truck. So they don't have to have specialized trucks. All of that adds cost. Um, so while I agree the contamination uh, would be much lower, everybody in the the recycling stream would probably be happier. I do think that there would be a cost to that that would be passed on to residents that I'm not sure they're willing to take on, um, let alone some of the recycling programs that are already struggling under single stream. So I would love it. I just, I don't know if it's if it's realistic at this point. Um, Gary, did you want to make a comment? I I, I thought you may have wanted to make a comment on dual. <clears throat> um, I just, uh, I, I would respond to uh, your question with the, uh, the comment that uh, uh, there are a number of communities that are looking at or moving towards uh, dual stream from single stream. Um, so uh, I agree with uh, Brian and Laura that the trends have uh, uh, over the last decade, uh, particularly in the last 20 years, actually, since China opened up uh, uh, their mills, um, uh, trended that way, but China stopped taking our crap. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's had a huge influence on the marketplace. And we're, we're starting to see investment in uh, uh, more uh, paper mills in this country and uh, more uh, commodity, uh, more uh, manufacturing in this country. Uh, so um, I, I don't think uh, we should assume single stream is um, a trend will continue. I think uh, it really uh, requires more analysis. The Container yep. Recycling Institute has done a great job on, on looking at those issues and and highlighted um, that uh, in, in many places, uh, dual stream can be more cost effective than single stream. Uh, and and uh, it requires... Uh, uh, a different business model uh, than uh, is traditionally pursued by the waste industry. Yeah. Yes, we, we, we're we seeing a, a, a more and more interest in, in dual stream uh, and in the California and New Jersey, uh, the state agencies are, are encouraging people to rethink uh, dual stream. Right now, the, the, the split is 80%, uh, roughly 80% single stream, 20% 
dual stream uh, prior to 2000, those numbers were reversed. And of course, the change happened very quickly in the early 2000s. Um, Gary, did you have any other questions you wanted to bring up? I've, I've got a few more here. Um, yeah. Um, ahead, Gary. Uh, the the um, uh, next question was for Frank on um, a greenwashing of products that say compostable, but are actually not in home compost bins. And uh, um, National Recycling Coalition is doing a webinar February 9th on truth in recycling labeling, uh, including both uh, recycling and compostable uh, labels uh, coming out of the legislation adopted in California. Uh, so that's February 9th is an upcoming webinar on that subject. But Frank, while you're here, uh, yeah, uh, um, address that. There, that there's topic. no yeah, there's no U.S. certification ASTM standard for home composting. The, uh, the ASTM committee is looking at it. There is one in Europe. Um, you know, uh, I know that there are other, other products that are, are, are also, you know, uh, ocean degradable and uh, will degrade in the soil and so forth. M most of the, 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 well, all of, all of this, the uh, food service packaging uh, that we promote that people should accept would be going to a commercial facility, um, BPI certified um, bio, uh, biodegradable products institute. Uh, and then we also uh, advise that people get field tested as well, which means at a composting facility, I know our members look at compostables uh, as, you know, as a way of bringing in more food scrap. Um, the issue is they're not easily identifiable with other contaminants. You have a lot of bioplastics that look like regular plastic, um, so you you know that causes problems for the bioplastic for the plastic industry. It causes problems for the composting industry. So um, we're trying to work with uh, with a, a group of stakeholders to develop a, a better way of identifying and labeling uh, compostable products. And you see some states have have jumped the gun on that. Washington and California. Or, or looking at the or Washington already has one. So contamination is a big issue. Um, I don't look at it as greenwashing. I, yeah, I look at it this way. I, I wouldn't put any of that in my home composting bin. I, you know, I, I just put what uh, produce scraps and eggshells and, and food scrap that I have. I really don't put any of the any kind of a compostable product in any of my uh, maybe shredded paper. That's about it. Thank you, Frank. Um, I have a question for Rachel. Um, I, I, first of all, I want to say I met Rachel because we're both part of the um, uh, Reuse Corridor Network in Central Appalachia, which is a very uh, dynamic group. And I know that uh, by announcing uh, a plant opening for polypropylene recycling in Southern Ohio, people are getting very excited about having a market for that. And my, my question is, um, Rachel, is that, is polypropylene, are you going to, is your company only dedicated to polypropylene or can you see your... Uh, you're uh, opening up um, uh, facilities to create markets for film plastic, um, or are you just going to uh, continue to focus on polypropylene? So what I'll say is our process, so if we did have a multi-layer film that did have a layer of polypropylene, technically we could process it through our purification process, but the other layers would come out as waste. And so obviously we're trying to target materials that you know we can give the most critical mass, you know, a next chance at life. Um, the technology has, is under research and development to be used for polyethylene. Um, however, I think we are, uh, you know, a ways away from commercializing it. Okay. Uh, th there is, uh, other companies are investing in film recovery. Um, uh, so th that's why I raised the issue. Um, Gary, did you have a point? Um, I have, I have one other question. But oh, go, go, go on. Okay, well, um, we all know that extended producer responsibility is in the air, as well as in the state and federal legislators, and it's still very unclear. I, I know Oregon and, and Massachusetts, excuse me, Oregon and Maine have passed bills, although we really don't know what they're like yet because the rules haven't been written. Um, I was just wondering if from each of the sectors, uh, EPR, uh, do you see EPR regulations coming in that would affect your industry in particular? And um, is it good, bad, or ugly for your industry? 
Um, and, and I would clarify, uh, Neil, uh, ahead, EPR, EPR for packaging uh, you, uh, is uh, uh, what I believe Neil is really uh, trying to uh, uh, yes. address. And uh, are you favoring the, the municipal reimbursement model coming out of Maine um, and the shared re uh, responsibility municipal reimbursement model coming out of Oregon uh, rather than having um, a uh, producer responsibility organization be totally in control as in British Columbia um, uh, in Canada? Uh, so those are the, the uh, really the heart of uh, the issues on, on EPR uh, right now. Who should be in charge of the program uh, is a critical element. And do you have any um, uh, uh, feelings about the uh, uh, ways to go forward uh, with those at the state or national level? Yeah, and you could respond as a representative of your industry or just a personal, uh, a personal <laughs> response. Uh, we, we don't want to hold anyone. Uh, get anyone in trouble. Terry, you've raised your hand. Please start us. Well, uh, so we deal with the extended producer responsibility in a couple different areas. Uh, and the one that we deal with uh, most nationally is the three states that currently uh, do mattress recycling, California, uh, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. And of course, we're looking at other places around the country. Uh, I will say that uh, that if you allow the industry trade group uh, to oversee the uh, producer responsibility in this particular case for mattresses, the mattress steward or the International Sleep Products Association uh, runs the programs in those three states. Uh, what you get is the opportunity to make sure that the, you know, the system is done well, that you get a lot of product coming back in and the money's collected and so forth. But there's no interest in actually improving the design of the product. Uh, so, so you end up with basically manufacturers who say in the, in this country, uh, manufacturers who say, look, I'm glad we're going to have this stuff, whatever it is taken back, uh, but we're also not going to, as manufacturers, make it possible to take our product back and reuse it. Uh, so, or to recycle it. Uh, and the example I will give is a twofold in that industry. Uh, the memory foam mattresses, the Caspers and whatever else, which are made up of a blend of, of, um, polyurethane and uh, latex um, make them very difficult to recycle because there's nobody who will take that mixed material and tease it out. And likewise, the pocket coil, which is an extremely po popular type of mattress support inside of a mattress, uh, each one of those pocket coils has a polypropylene bag around it. Mm. Uh, and that bag is extremely difficult to separate from the steel. And the result is virtually all of the mattresses that are deconstructed in California, Rhode Island, and Connecticut that are pocket coils end up going into the landfill. So wow. even though you have a producer responsibility, since nobody can tease the product back apart and the steel industry will not take that product because they can't figure out how to get the bag separate from the steel, you end up having a system that is designed um, kind of upside down and backwards. Complicated. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, any other uh, comments on uh, the EPR for packaging? Uh, actually, yeah. Terry Terry was talking about mattresses. We could we could go beyond packaging, but we're mostly concerned concerned with packaging here. Frank, uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of these obviously pop up state by state. Uh, they mentioned compostable products. Uh, we're working with with uh, with BPI. Um, we, we want to be at the table. We don't want to be on the menu. Um, a, a, a lot of times what we see is we see the language that they want to charge, um, you know, producers for producing compostable products, but the, the funds will go towards just recycling infrastructure. It does not designate composting infrastructure. Mm. So um, I, I think, you know, we need to sort it all out. We definitely need to be at the table. Um, and we need, it, as far as, you know, who gets to share the money and who makes those decisions, that's the most important thing about this whole thing is we really need a system that makes sense and that the money goes to the, back to the municipalities to really build infrastructure. Yes, we, uh, as many people know, the Institute is, is, uh, believes that if there is an EPR system, we think that reimbursement uh, to the states, cities and counties are critical. Uh, mainly, many reasons, but perhaps the primary is that it leads decision-making at the local level where citizens and small business have, 
small businesses have a uh, have, can have an impact. Um, <clears throat> if there are no other, uh, it, it looks like uh, Scott oh, yeah. was trying to chime in. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I missed that. Go ahead, Scott. Not at all. No worries. I was just going to say that uh, in terms of EPR, I mean, for us, I mentioned those four pillars of action. One of which increase and improve household and away from home recycling. Certainly, one way to do that is with EPR. I think for us, the the main thing we want to see is that uh, each material is paying its own way. So the the hard part is looking at the per package fee that's going to come, making sure that's fair and done in a way that I think to Terry's point, it's driving design and choices on the front end and and not just funding what we need to increase and improve household and away from home recycling. I would say more of an action area for us is beverage container deposit systems, which I view as a form of EPR. And you need it for beverage containers because they're so portable and you need that financial incentive for people to hold onto it. If we just do EPR and, and get more carts out there, that's nice. But it's specific for beverage containers, you need this additional system, and we think they can coexist. Uh, Laura, I see you sh uh, shaking your head. Could, could you uh, amplify on what Scott was saying? I'm, I'm just agreeing with Scott. I mean, that's kind of the initial thought from the glass side, that there's already a proven form of VPR that works really well if designed yeah. well, and that would be deposit or redemption. Actually, most people consider a, a, a container uh, uh, deposits the, the first uh, form of EPR. And it, of course, is also a source reduction technique uh, because the materials get reused. Um, on, on that point, uh, Neil, I'd just like to highlight the Sierra Club uh, National Zero Waste Team developed a uh, beverage container um, um, uh, policy uh, statement uh, that, that uh, highlights the points that uh, Scott and Laura just made. Um, so if you're looking for um, um, environmental support uh, uh, for um, uh, and, and addressing what are the ins and outs of beverage container uh, legislation, uh, take a look at uh, go to Sierra Club National Zero Waste Team for uh, uh, finding that that uh, guidance document. And uh, in there, they highlight that beverage container redemption laws um, and deposit laws uh, have resulted in um, about uh, twice the amount of recovery of the targeted materials uh, compared to others, which is why they're so important to do first, uh, because we can get so much more high quality uh, materials uh, to feed, hopefully, the new investments that uh, this industry that we see on the stage here today uh, will be uh, uh, able to use. Yeah. Um if I can uh, just uh, ask Terry uh, uh, to respond to something that I've been following in Portucket, Rhode Island, they started a, a new curbside collection of reusables, uh, repairable and reusables, uh, to facilitate households uh, getting things repaired and, and recycled, uh, reused, I should say, rather than dumping it in the uh, in the landfill bin. Um, have you seen um, any of, more of that or anything like that at the municipal level, Terry? where cities are making an effort to get reusables from the households? Well, it varies, uh, as you know, around the country, uh, and it's, it, it's an uneven bag. Uh, so the short answer is yes. Uh, we have seen more municipalities interested in either at the transfer sites uh, or in partnership with our nonprofit community to find a way to get that product out of the stream. Uh, the drive-through donation areas associated with the Goodwills and other organizations out there are one of the keys on that one because you can use that as a place where you can drive product in, not only reusable product, but other products that can be mm -hmm. pulled out of the stream. Uh, yeah. So it's an interesting hybrid that can come out of that. Uh, so that's kind of a different type of infrastructure. It's I, also, I, hmm, yeah, I just want to mention, you mentioned it in passing, but both uh, uh, Terry's uh, organization, St. Vincent's, and uh, Urban Ore have contracts respectively with San Francisco and Berkeley to actually pull reusables out at the transfer site. And uh, I, I know they're pulling out a lot of material each week and each month. Uh, and uh, it, it, I don't think it's unique across the country. It's the only two programs I'm aware of at this point. It's about 30 tons a day. 30 tons a day. Terrific. Um, and, and, and from what I understand uh, from, from Urban Ore, they pull out both reusables and obvious recyclables that, that can be uh, just recycled as opposed to refurbished and reused. Um, we, we have a few more minutes. Uh, um, Gary, do you see any other questions coming in? Um, <clears throat> I there were a number of questions for PureCycle. Um, 
and uh, one was high, uh, thanking for uh, not being, uh, uh, that they're not chemical recycling. Um, uh, the reference to chemical recycling is the fact that um, uh, uh, there's a lot of confusion being uh, purposely <laughs> introduced in the marketplace by uh, lumping plastic to plastic and plastic to fuel as chemical or advanced recycling. Um, the, the, the um, um, are, are you able to make, a uh, question came in though, are you able to maintain the integrity and make a plastic bottle a plastic bottle again? Uh, uh, Christina Trujillo was asking uh, for Rachel. Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, again, because we're not manipulating the monomer, all of the properties of the resin that is used on the input remain. So your melt flow is gonna be the same, your, um, your mechanical properties are going to remain. So, um, you know, in the event we can get critical mass of, you know, a whole load of, of dairy tubs, then, you know, the output would be the same type of resin to go back in. So ideally you could have that closed loop. Great. And a follow up, how much energy does your process use compared to uh, virgin plastic? Uh, what chemicals or pollutants are given off and how are those pollutants captured and disposed? So that's a great question. I'm going to do my best because I'm not the uh, on the engineering team, but um, we are lower than than uh, virgin production, so we use less energy. Um, and then, as far as our emissions, you know, we do have particulate matter, but you know, that's basically the dust from the very processing of you know the grinding up the material before it's going into the purification. And then our solvent um, is classified as a a VOC, um, extremely small levels. Uh, and, uh, but other than that, nothing hazardous. Okay. And, um, the last aspect uh, for you is, is, um, isn't the ultimate goal to stop the extraction of fossil fuels that's required to create new polypropylenes? I mean, I think in an ideal world, yes, we should be able to use, you know, the resources that we've already mined out. Um, you know, so having these solutions that can go back into these high value applications, I think is key. You're seeing more and more innovation that um, is, is allowing that to happen, enabling that to happen. Um, but yes, I would agree that's the, uh, the ideal state. Yeah, I, I would just like to add to that with regard to plastic recycling, not only does it save energy compared to virgin plastic, but it also reduces the amount of, of uh, elasticizers and uh, all the other chemicals that go into making the product that we want, uh, those, those chemicals are reduced as well. And, and we uh, also want to reduce single-use plastics yep. uh, as, a, as a, uh, a goal ahead of all that <laughs> as well. So um, uh, getting back to uh, returnables, reusables um, um, is, is from a zero waste perspective is certainly the type of investment we like to see and was highlighted at the National Zero Waste Conference in December and uh, the National Reuse Network is doing a great job uh, highlighting that particularly for foodware. We have a, a question here from Mr. Uh, Grant Amiani. I, I hope I'm spend, spell, uh, pronouncing his name correctly. And um, I'm paraphrasing his question, but he says that cities uh, are, are informed people of the, at the, how to deal with the curbside, what happens at the MRF. But he wants to know, uh, he says that there's rarely any explanation or accountability about where materials go beyond the MRF? And he asks for any advice on how to find this kind of information. Um, before I ask people to respond, I wanna point out that um, our very good friend, Louise Mann, who's a recycling activist down in uh, uh, Fayetteville, uh, Fayetteville is in Arkansas, um, uh, actually is uh, promoting a, a type of bill called the Recycling Transparency Bill, which uh, which ask Murf to say where where's your paper going where's your uh, where where are all your materials going, so um, can anyone um, give advice to Mr. Amiani as to where he might find out this type of information? Where, yeah, Neil, I can. Um, Please, Brian. AFMK, yeah, AFMK put together a uh, video that addresses that very issue uh, in 2021. It's available on our website. WWW.AFANDPA.org. Uh, look for the resources section. There's a section there on recycling and scroll through it. Um, it's a great video. It addresses a lot of the misconceptions about what happens 
uh, to uh, materials. Uh, when they get into the consumer stream, do they really get recycled? What happens to them? What kind of products do they get made into? That sort of thing. Well, that, uh, we have the right people on this call. Thank you uh, for sure. answering that. Um, we're, we're at time. We certainly could stay for a few more minutes. Um, Gary, I don't see any questions that we may have missed here. Um, I, I, I just uh, I came across one from Susan Shore, just briefly, sure. um, uh, a quick response, a lightning round. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the need for consumer education, but the beverage industry has historically been against beverage container deposit laws. What is your organization doing to educate those who have blocked these laws in the past? Uh, 30 seconds uh, each to anyone who wants to answer. Well, I'll just say that uh, we've engaged the beverage companies directly. I would say that they're much more open to this than ever before. Uh, but also in terms of how we're educating, uh, we're on the ground in some states that we think we can get this passed. We've written op-eds. I put one in the chat with Reloop and US Perg. We wrote one as well with uh, Glass Packaging Institute and NAPCOR, the PET Trade Association. So you can see all the material groups. We see this as a way, beverage as deposits as a way to get the material back. And I would say the beverage brands are willing to engage on this conversation for sure. Anyone um, else want the last 30 seconds? <laughs> okay. Well, we, we do have uh, questions coming in uh, left and right. So um, what, what I propose, Gary, uh, tell me if this is possible. Can we uh, send the questions uh, that have come into the pan uh, on these on the Q and A to our uh, <clears throat> to our uh, panelists and ask them to try to answer some of the questions that are uh, directed toward their particular commodity? Uh, uh, certainly, and and uh, we can work together with you uh, on that. Uh, we will be saving the chat. We'll be sending the chat with the recordings links. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, uh, further pursue uh, those, uh, we can uh, work with you on that. Well, okay, I, I really am uh, thrilled and appreciate the, the panelists' participation. We got a wonderful uh, tour of various materials, lots more to discuss, and please stay tuned for more uh, Recycle is Infrastructure 2 campaign webinars and also the American Recycling Infrastructure Plan. Uh, stay tuned with that, and we appreciate all the work you folks do in getting that stuff out of landfills and out of incinerators. Thanks Thank again. You. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.